Hello and welcome back to Fourier Transform, the video course where we talk a lot about the theory of so-called Fourier series. And in today's part 21, we will try to extend our Fourier expansion also for L1 functions. So we also have to leave the nice geometry we have in our Hilbert space L2 behind us. The actual meaning of that we will discuss soon, but first I want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And please note that the Steady membership gives you a lot of advantages. For example, you can download the PDF version and quizzes for the videos. This is quite helpful if you want to quickly look up what we have already discussed in former videos. For example, now you already should have a good knowledge about the Fourier series in L2. In fact, there we could use the whole geometry the L2 space gives us and see the Fourier series as an orthogonal projection. This was all possible because the square integrable 2 pi periodic functions have this nice inner product. And please note, to make the formulas nicer, we normalize this integral by the factor 1 over 2 pi. However, the most important part is that this whole construction only works so nicely because we restrict ourselves to square integrable functions. Hence, if we relax this requirement, we will lose the inner product. So if we go to the bigger L1 space, our geometry picture will not work anymore. Therefore, the question is, what can we still say about the Fourier series if we only consider integrable functions? But maybe first we should write down a proof of this subset relation such that we see that we really have an extension here. So what we need to show is that a function from L2 also lies in L1. First we can take the fact that f is square integrable, which means we can use our inner product. Moreover, for the second input in the inner product we can use a constant function. So this denotes the function that is 1 everywhere, so it's definitely also square integrable over the interval from minus pi to pi. And now in the next step we can also put in some absolute values, which means instead of f, we consider the absolute value of f. And on the other hand, we can also put the absolute value around the inner product, even if it's not really needed here. However, if we write it like that, you immediately see that the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is applicable here. Hence, on the right hand side we find the product of two norms, namely the one of f and the other one, which is the L2 norm of the constant function 1. And there we can immediately write that the norm of this constant is 1. So this is really nice, because we only have the L2 norm of f on the right hand side, which means now we also want to have the L1 norm of f on the left hand side. And this one is easy to get, because we already know that the inner product is essentially just the integral. So we really have the absolute value of f inside the integral from minus pi to pi. And now since the right hand side here is a finite number, the left hand side is also a finite number. In other words, here we have an estimate between the L1 norm and the L2 norm. And exactly this inequality represents the subset relation. And please note, it does not work the other way around, L1 is really bigger than L2. You immediately see that when you consider a function which is 2 pi periodic and has 1 over the square root of x in it. Around 0 this function would explode, but it's still in L1. This is easy to see, because the antiderivative of this function behaves like square root of x. However, if we square this function, we have 1 over x, which is not integrable at all. So in summary, this is a function which is integrable, but not square integrable. So if you want, we can also omit the equality here in the subset relation. So we definitely have an extension here, because the space L1 is bigger. But now the thing is, that we don't have any problems defining the Fourier series for these functions as well. In other words, the Fourier coefficients, given by this inner product, still exist. So please note, we still use our inner product notation outside of our actual inner product space. This is possible because the inner product just represents an integral. And this integral just always exists for any L1 function, simply because the absolute value of the function inside 
is equal to the absolute value of f. This is quite clear because the exponential function has a modulus of 1. Hence the Fourier coefficients are always well defined no matter which L1 function we choose. And this also implies that the Fourier series is well defined as well. Indeed this is quite clear because the Fourier series is just a finite linear combination inside our vector space. However in that case we don't know anything about the convergence of this series yet. And please compare that with the L2 case where we already know it's convergent with respect to the L2 norm. Analogously we could now examine the convergence with respect to the L1 norm. However this is not a simple task at all and we can already look at the surface of the problem. And in order to do that let's introduce a short notation for the Fourier coefficients here. And the common way to do it is to write f hat with input k. So now you can remember f hat k stands for this whole integral. This means we get a whole sequence where the index z is given by z. Or to say it in other words we have a map from the integers into c. And indeed f hat you can call the Fourier transformation of two pi periodic functions. So it's important to note that in this case the Fourier transformation gives you a sequence in z. So the question for us is what can we say about this sequence now? And in fact in the L2 case we can say a lot because we have already proven Parseval's identity there. So there our hat is a linear map which has the L2 space as an input space. And on the other hand the output space is clearly a space of sequences. And these are the so called square summable sequences denoted by lowercase l2. So not so complicated a sequence lies in that space if the index z is z and you can take each entry in the absolute value squared and sum it up and still get a finite number out. And indeed this is what we already know by Parseval's identity. It tells us that the coefficients in the Fourier series are square summable. Indeed it tells us even more because it also says what happens with the inner product. Namely if you want to calculate the inner product f with g you can put in our orthonormal system. Which means we have the convergence of this series given by the Fourier coefficients. Which also means we can shorten it with the hat notation. And there please note the first entry is just the complex conjugate of f hat. And now actually what we find there is exactly the inner product we have in our lowercase l2. Indeed it's exactly the same idea as the inner product in the integral sense. However this also tells us that we have a one to one translation of the inner product as well. Indeed we would say that this hat transformation given as a linear map is a Hilbert space isomorphism. It's a translation between the two inner product spaces which are essentially the same thing. So you see Parseval's identity is really nice and it tells us that we can jump between these two spaces as much as we want. However this nice connection will break down when we extend the space on the left hand side. Obviously this has to happen because we don't have this inner product structure anymore in L1. Therefore the first question would be what is the output space in the L1 case. So we know it's a space of sequences where the index z is given by z and the members lie in the complex numbers. However maybe we can say even more like in the L2 case. Indeed the first thing we can prove is that the sequences that come out have at least a limit. So you could say this is the space of sequences ak where every ak is a complex number and you can look at the limit that k goes to plus or minus infinity. And now this limit makes sense it exists. Of course these two limits could be different but in the case of our Fourier series we know even more. We know that both limits exist and that they are equal to zero. So the output we get with the Fourier transformation here lies definitely inside this space of sequences. And I can already tell you the common notation we have for that space is lowercase c zero. Indeed the name already explains it convergent with limit zero. 
Moreover, I should say this result we can prove in the next video because it's the famous Riemann-Lebesgue lemma. So I really hope I meet you there again and have a nice day. Bye bye.